Shall we resume the sitting? And uh, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, and I call on Philip McGuigan. Mr. McGuigan. Dr. Melgood, can I call your uh, case, Deborah Hayne, question one? Tackling the climate emergency is the single biggest global challenge we face. And as Infrastructure Minister, I have made addressing climate change one of my key priorities. I am focused on delivering clean public transport and active travel options to build connectivity, reduce emissions and promote health and well-being for all. Earlier this year, I announced TransLink's procurement of three hydrogen buses, which will see the first hydrogen buses and the first hydrogen refuelling station in Ireland. It is anticipated that these vehicles will go into service later this year. In addition, I have committed £55 million of capital funding in line with the commitments in New Decade New Approach for the purchase of 100 zero emission vehicles by TransLink over the next two years. These vehicles will include 80 battery electric buses and 20 hydrogen fuel cell buses. It is anticipated the new buses will go into service in Belfast and Derry in spring 2022. I can assure the member that I am ambitious and I am committed to delivering on the decarbonisation of public transport. I recognise that collectively with my executive colleagues and with the members of this assembly, we can deliver lasting change for our communities. However, to make the change that we desire, we need to invest in infrastructure now for the future. I recognise that investment in infrastructure is not an end in itself. It is about people and place. It is about unlocking our economic potential, protecting our valuable environment to transform and connect lives. And it is about improving health and well-being for all our communities across the North. Philip McQuiggan, supplementary. Uh, can call you. Uh, I welcome the Minister's answer and her, and her commitment. Obviously, in the midst of a climate emergency, uh, with transport one of the biggest uh, contributors to carbon uh, emissions, we obviously need to fully embrace uh, sustainable transport methods. Can I ask the Minister how the, department, uh, how the Department's upcoming regional tran strategic transport network plan will help in reducing help and efforts to uh, decarbonise the transport sector and also maybe get an update on the £30 million for low-carbon buses announced in June. I thank the member for his question. Within the regional transport uh, plans, we are developing our road and our public transport network, and for me that is an important component of the decarbonisation. But as he says, I have invested uh, 30 million this year uh, in terms of the uh, low emission and zero emission buses. And as I say, we have three hydrogen buses, the first in Ireland to come online uh, before the end of this year with the first hydrogen refuelling station. I'm also keen to work with TransLink so that we can see decarbonisation, decarbonisation right across our bus and our rail network. And I look forward to working with the member and others in terms of realising this. Call Mervyn Story. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer, and she will be aware, following a, a conversation a meeting we had with Rightbus in my own constituency in North Antrim, uh, the importance of this issue, particularly to that company. And given uh, the issue of uh, hydrogen, how important it is, uh, what uh, undertakings and what in information can the Minister give us in terms of discussions that she has had with the UK Government in drawing down our share of the money that was allocated in relation to uh, the zero emissions uh, buses, and also will she give a commitment to ensuring that this is a matter which, right across this executive, is not only in her department, the Department of the Economy, and other ministers, so that we get an outcome rather than just proposals and plans? I thank the member um, for his question. Uh, and as I said in my initial response, we have tangibly and prag pragmatically moved this forward in terms of the procurement of the three hydrogen buses. Uh, as you say, this is a commitment in new decade, new approach. Uh, and on a very regular basis, I am in contact with the British government to remind them uh, of their commitments and the compelling need to uh, honour those. Uh, in terms of discussions with executive colleagues, you're absolutely right. Uh, zero carbon uh, is a, a ambition for the executive in its entirety. And just yesterday, uh, I met with the finance minister, the DERA minister and the economy minister to talk about the opportunities that we have across public transport, across our wastewater infrastructure, right across our, our public services to advance this whole agenda, given that we have very ambitious targets around uh, zero carbon emissions uh, and given the importance of the pressing climate emergency facing all of us. I call Robbie Butler. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. 
And in your answer to uh, Mr. McGuigan's question, and you did uh, mention active active travel initiative. I know you've been uh, shown great leadership in that respect. Um, can you outline to us any uh, conversations you've had with local council with regard to planning matters, particularly area planning, and how we can partner and you can partner with your department with local councils to ensure that this is embedded right down to the, the community and societal level? I thank the member for his question. Uh, and the whole active travel agenda is one that's very important to me, but also I think one that's hugely important in terms of public health, uh, in terms of climate action. And we really do have a wonderful opportunity, I believe, now. Yes, we've got the challenges of COVID and the challenges of Brexit. But we also have renewed momentum, I think, among communities to embrace active travel. We also have development of um, the local development plans within councils. So I think now is a very opportune moment to be working in partnership uh, with all of the councils and with local communities. And in fact, my department and my walking, wheeling and cycling champion has been in very close contact and engagement with all of the councils. That's why we're able to advance the park and ride schemes. And we're working with them really closely to realise a number of active travel projects right across North in Ireland. I call Dolores Kelly. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Minister, thank you for your um, answers so far. But could you provide an update on your department's work to tackle uh, climate change and uh, how you've been hoping to green our infrastructure, including uh, public transport? I thank the member uh, for her question. Um, yes, I am very committed to doing what I can within my department, working with executive colleagues, working with councils and with communities to tackle the climate emergency. Uh, I'm always struck by the way we as a community in Northern Ireland have rallied together in terms of our response to the COVID crisis. And I think we will see that impetus and it's important that we do encourage everyone in our communities to realise the pressing emergency that is cli the climate crisis that is also facing us. We're trying to do what we can within the area of public transport. You will also know that I had requested a sharp, sharp external review of the York Street Interchange project, a very important strategic project to which I'm very committed, but again, one that I want to ensure is inclusive about communities, sits very well with all of our current strategic plans and also plays a key role in terms of the climate uh, emergency. This approach is something that I want to embed right across the department so that we are seeing things in terms of a green recovery across every single aspect of certainly the Department for Infrastructure and I would hope right across the executive. Okay, Mayor, before I call the next question, I should say that question 14 has been withdrawn. I call Jerry Kelly. Yes, and, uh, question two, let's hope. Um, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I would like to group question two and seven. Um, in line with the commitments within New Decade, New Approach, I have begun early discussions with Minister Ryan on a feasibility study of a potential high-speed rail connection north and south as we seek to create a spine of connectivity on the island. The intention of a feasibility study will be to provide a high-level analysis of the potential of both high-speed and higher-speed rail to support the wider outcomes and priorities of both the Irish Government and the Northern Ireland Executive. It will allow for a consideration of options from electrification of existing lines to bring maximum speed up to approximately 120 miles per hour to the development of a new high-speed connection on the corridor. Work is ongoing and I intend to engage further with my counterpart, Minister Ryan, to discuss this project further at tomorrow's NSMC Transport Sectoral Meeting. In relation to improving the All-Ireland Rail Network, I am committed to improving transport links for the benefit of our economy and communities across our island. Improving connectivity between the north and south is a key priority for me, providing increased social inclusion, enhanced economic opportunities and an improved environment for all of our citizens. Rail, I firmly believe, is an untapped opportunity with multiple benefits that can play a crucial part in our future, and I'm looking forward to making progress with our colleagues in the Irish Government. Jerry Kelly, supplementary. We just left an oral hand, uh, Fragra uh, Shin, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far and agree with uh, a number of the things she said. And, uh, and I will agree with her that they need to improve north-south uh, connectivity. It uh, starts with uh, north-south um, transport um, connections, also to promote regionally balanced growth and to address the effects of uh, partition on the island's uh, infrastructure. However, uh, Bus Orion, I think the last week or the week before, certainly suspended uh, the bus service from Dublin to Belfast uh, indefinitely. And I would ask the Minister, since she is... Um, meeting uh, her counterpart in uh, Dublin, 
Um, could she raise this issue and try and reverse that decision? I thank the member um, for his question, and he raises a, a very important point. I was informed by Minister Ryan's office on Saturday, the 26th of September, that the Bus Arm Board would be recommending the indefinite suspension of the Belfast Dublin service. I can assure the member that I am committed to securing island wide services between Belfast and Dublin, and I will be discussing this matter with Minister Ryan at tomorrow's NSMC transport meeting. Uh, my department will continue to work to provide services for our communities north and south and will work with TransLink to minimise the overall impact to passengers. I call Justin McNulty. Gurumay Abbott, Con Corla. Can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far? Can I ask the Minister what support is required from across the Executive to deliver on All Ireland Rail that will help enhance our All Ireland economy? I thank the member for his question. Uh, as he knows, I am determined to make progress on island-wide connectivity. In the face of Brexit and economic turbulence, never before has the case for all island connectivity been stronger. Rail is a crucial part of the jigsaw for growing connectivity north, south and enhancing our island economy. I'm pleased to say I've been working very closely with Minister Ryan and we have together discussed how we can move forward on progressing this important area. And while we are in regular contact, I'm delighted to be meeting him formally tomorrow at the sectoral meeting on transport. But the member asks a valid question on the required support for All Ireland Rail. Across the globe, we are seeing investment in critical infrastructure as a means to help communities build towards recovery. With the economic strain here, the crisis of the climate emergency, COVID and Brexit, we need to make strategic choices to enhance our economy and connect our communities. I will, of course, need funding, but given our commitments in new decade, new approach to delivering change and investing in infrastructure, I hope that my executive colleagues will support the delivery our communities need. I call Michelle McElveen. Thank the Minister for her responses. In terms of developing Northern Ireland's regional connectivity, the European superhighway cr across the North Channel is central to accessing our largest market, but it's also the most expensive sea crossing in Western Europe. And the A77 and the A75 that it connects to are probably amongst the worst roads in Scotland. What work is the Minister and her department doing to reduce costs and to secure Scottish or national government investment in order to address this? I thank the member for her question, and this is a, an issue that spans a number of government departments. My officials are working with their counterparts in Scotland. I am in close contact with Michael Matheson, my ministerial counterpart, because we recognise the strategic importance of that connection. And of course, I will continue to press the British government to ensure that we can get the required investment, to ensure that we can get the road upgrades, that we can get that connectivity that is required to support our economy and connect our communities. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, has any thoughts, you talked about north-south connectivity, has any thoughts been given to east-west connectivity and perhaps an investigation into rail transport towards Dungannon and on to Enniskillen? I'm very mindful of east-west connectivity. I think that COVID, uh, one of the positivities, and I've said that before on the floor of this assembly, that I certainly have benefited from is having close engagement with ministerial counterparts across these islands. I have developed a very positive working relationship with Michael Matheson in Scotland, with my counterpart in Wales, and al although at times it's fractious, also with grant chaps uh, in the department um, for transport, and that is something, that engagement that I don't want to lose, I want to build on. I think it's particularly important in the face of, of Brexit. I am very ambitious for our real opportunities. The difficulty that I will face is my ambition being curtailed by a lack of investment and funding. Public transport has suffered hugely, like all organisations, as a result of COVID, with a dramatic drop uh, in passenger numbers and therefore income. The battle for me is to secure necessary investment to protect our existing uh, public transport network, but I want to assure the member that my ambitions don't stop there. I want to see real connectivity pushed across Northern Ireland. I want to see public transport as a cornerstone of our economic uh, and our climate action strategy going forward as an executive. I call Jim Allister. Ms McElveen raised the issue. I'm content. Okay. Thank you. Moving on then to uh, Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister to follow on? Sorry, question three, sorry. That'll do. 
As Minister responsible for promoting and improving road safety, I want to work actively with all partners to reduce death and serious injuries on our roads. As such, I have regular discussions with PSNI in relation to road safety, and I am acutely aware of the ongoing road safety concerns relating to car cruises in Portrush and Port Stewart. I recognise that local residents are extremely concerned about the adverse effects caused by speeding and noise pollution from vehicles in the area. My officials have had discussions with both PSNI and Causeway Coast and Glens Council about these events, and I understand that a further multi-agency meeting is to be arranged. You may also be interested to know that the Department is currently progressing the legislation to extend the existing traffic calming measures on Lansdowne Road in Portrush. This will introduce some additional traffic calming humps to address some of the concerns about speeding in Portrush. I can advise you that DVA provided technical support during a multi-agency enforcement operation in Port Rush and Port Stewart on the 30th of August, which coincided with the recent car cruise event. During the course of the operation, police escorted 14 modified cars to Coleraine Vehicle Test Centre, where each vehicle was thoroughly examined by an enforcement officer using the agency's vehicle test equipment. Results from these inspections revealed that 12 vehicles, that was 85 per cent, were found to be non-compliant with construction and use requirements to varying degrees, and that four were found to be in such serious or such dangerous condition that they could not continue to be used on a public road. Overall, there were 12 vehicles subject to immediate prohibition action due to varying road safety critical defects, with several drivers informed that they would be reported with a few to prosecution by police. Morris Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for her, her, her response. Uh, I have had those detailed conversations with the local PSNA, and I am aware of the figures. But uh, I, I was thinking, would the Minister be uh, prepared to work with the multi agency uh, task force to look at uh, ways of perhaps closing off the promenade during those peak uh, times, Sundays and Saturdays being the worst? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, for his supplementary question, and I know it's an issue that he's been working uh, very hard on locally. Uh, the police can and do close roads in both Port Stewart and Port Rush when they have concerns about public safety. Um, we do, however, need to be clear that this isn't really the solution, as we want all drivers to use the road with respect to all. But I assure him that my officials have attended the multi-agency meetings to date and will engage with all the partner organisations to try to address this issue and the concerns of local residents. They call Kiva Archibald. Thank um, you, um, and I, I thank the Minister for um, her comprehensive response. Um, similar to Mr. Bradley, I will be in regular contact with the PSNI around these events on, a, on an annual basis. Um, and as you have touched on you, um, about how you are addressing the issues in relation to congestion um, and speeding, um, but also in relation to the air pollution that would come with that, is that something that you are also looking at, Gormilgut? It, it, it very much is. I, I see this problem as one uh, of multiple layers, and I think we need to have a comprehensive uh, approach to it. Uh, tackling the modifications issue and the, and the dangerous condition that a number of these vehicles are in will help with that in terms of modifications to exhaust, uh, doing what we can to ensure that they are not gathering in large numbers and revving uh, their engines is also an important component of that. And we will continue to work with all elected representatives, uh, with the PSNI, with the council, and with the local communities to try to get this situation under control. Call Cara Hunter. Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, I welcome that the Minister has been very helpful by agreeing to ensure traffic calming measures uh, and that they will be progressed. Um, and I'm grateful that she recognises the stress uh, this has caused my constituents by some boy uh, racer enthusiasts. Can I ask, please, for an update uh, on the traffic calming measures uh, that will assist in stopping cruising and speeding? <laughs> Again, I thank the member um, for her question. Um, yes, uh, as I've outlined, my department is currently progressing the legislation to extend the existing traffic calming measures on Lansdowne Road in Port Rush. The scheme will consist of the following measures. Uh, one set of speed cushions on Causeway View between the junctions of Lansdowne Crescent and Princess Street, and two sets of speed cushions on Lower Lansdowne Road. The proposal was advertised earlier this year and there were no objections. I recognise how concerning the situation is for residents and I am pleased that the scheme is planned to be in place this financial year. Well, Claire Sugden. 
Mr Speaker, and I want to thank my constituency colleague, Mr Bradley, for raising it in the House. Um, it's an issue that all the MLAs have been contacted about, and I do appreciate the Minister saying that it's not just an infrastructure issue, it's a multi-agency uh, issue. It's, in fact, it's an interdepartmental issue, because ultimately this gave rise to quite serious antisocial behaviour, um, which culminated in quite a serious and significant event, which led to the prom being closed. Um, I suppose I have a concern that we may face this again at other times of the year. And you know, would the minister work with the Minister of Justice to look at this as an antisocial behaviour uh, issue and what measures she can add to that to, to uh, mitigate these, this happening again? The, the member for a question and to place on record my appreciation to local representatives of all parties who have been representing their constituents concerning this issue and also been very much in solution mode uh, as well. So representing their constituents concerns but also coming up with practical ideas about how we can work together to address this. I mean, My officials have attended the multi-agency meeting. Um, I uh, am I'm not aware, I know the PS and I were there, I don't know if there was any representatives from the Department for Justice uh, but a partnership approach is the right approach in this instance uh, and my officials will work across all government departments and with all statutory agencies uh, to try to address this and bring peace of mind um, and a better quality of life to the residents that are affected. Moving on, I call Gary Middleton. Number four, Mr Speaker. In June, I announced my commitment to fund the continued development of a number of strategic road improvement schemes, including the A2 Bunkrana Road, as part of my plan to aid economic recovery and community transformation while addressing regional imbalance. Consistent with my wider priorities, I am committed to ensuring that this scheme is future-proofed and will help stimulate the green recovery. My department will continue to progress the A2 Bunkrana Road scheme in line with my objectives, which include improving transport links, road safety and traffic progression, and contributing to the regeneration of the area whilst maintaining the environment and achieving value for money. Earlier this year, I met with local business owners in the area and have committed to exploring what options can be looked at in light of their concerns. I am keen to work in partnership with the community to deliver positive change for the North West. I would hope to be in a position to decide upon the progression to the next stage, which includes publication of the draft statutory orders for consultation by mid-2021. Gary Middleton, supplementary. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, for her response. Uh, I've met recently with local businesses who uh, put across the position that there's a potential of 300 jobs to be lost if the development plan isn't adjusted. Uh, they have been met, unfortunately, this minute in time with uh, some of the officials rejecting those proposals. Will the Minister intervene and ensure that those 300 jobs are protected and that the concerns of those businesses are upheld? I thank the Member for his supplementary uh, question. Uh, as I say, um, earlier this year I met with the local businesses on the Bukrana Road to hear directly their views and concerns. And I have asked my officials to continue discussions with all stakeholders over the coming months while progressing scheme development, in particular to ensure that it meets my objectives, but also that we work to try to address the concerns that are being expressed locally. I call Martina Anderson. Mr. Good Minister, uh, you know that I have spoken to you about this matter at the committee. I've wrote to you on it and I've raised questions. And like Gary Milton, I've also met uh, with, with some of the retailers as well. And um, I just want to ask you the question again because they're not convinced that road service is really taking them serious enough that they need modifications to the original plan. We all support the Bunkrana Road, the A2, it's vitally important for the city to unlock the potential. So, Minister, I think it would be important if you could send them a signal today that you are listening, I know you are listening to them, but the modification of the road will definitely be taken into account in the context of new decade, new approach, co-design, nothing about us without us. I thank the member um, for her question uh, and as I said I, I specifically wanted to meet with the local business owners earlier this year to hear directly in a face-to-face -face meeting the concerns uh, that they have. I've said very clearly to my officials that they need to be engaging and working with local stakeholders. Uh, I've said all along since I've taken up this post that we need to work in partnership. Uh, local people know what works best. Obviously I have strategic priorities in terms of my department uh, and a number of measures that we need to meet around value of money, uh, but I think that we get to the right place and we get better outcomes when we all work together. So I can assure you that I will continue to listen and I've asked my officials to continue to engage directly so that we can work forward together. Call Carol Hunter. 
Uh, Martina has raised my issue, so I'm content. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And moving on to question number five, Andrew Muir. Uh, firstly, I must stress that securing the financial future of our public transport network remains a priority for me as we respond to the pandemic and develop sustainable ways of connecting people and communities to opportunities. My department's estimate of financial support required by TransLink for the remainder of the current financial year is £20 million, and my department will continue to bid for the shortfall. This sum takes into account the planned efficiencies identified by TransLink in response to COVID-19, as well as the most up-to-date picture of customer demand. We must also recognise that reduced passenger numbers does not automatically mean a similar reduction in the level of costs for the company. TransLink continues to play a vital role in ensuring that our citizens can continue to access their jobs, education and essential services. And I want to be clear that this funding is necessary if we want TransLink to continue to provide that service. Protecting a publicly owned public transport network and safeguarding jobs and ensuring a network that is accessible for all and based on need, not solely on profit, remains my priority. And one I know all executive colleagues share, given the renewed commitment I recently secured to ensure the network is protected and funded. Andrew Muir, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. At the outset, I would declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink. Significant funds have been allocated across the water to train operating companies, to bus operators, and also to Transport for London. That has come across to Northern Ireland as Barnet Consequentials. Does the Minister not agree with me that the failure to pass that on and pass that support on to TransLink will have a devastating impact upon local communities and also upon our efforts to tackle climate change? In short, I fully agree with the comments that the member has made on his um, analysis. Uh, on my desk, I have a very high pile of correspondence from across all political parties asking for additional services, additional train halts, extension of rail lines, and I wish that I was in a position to be able to grant them all. Uh, but as I say, TransLink is facing a hugely difficult situation as a result of COVID. And as you rightly say, we have seen right across these islands, the governments have recognised that. They have recognised the importance of our public transport in terms of connecting people, tackling the climate emergency, and also as a social justice element. So many people cannot afford cars and are wholly reliant on our public transport network. So I will continue to make the case uh, at the executive, uh, and I very much look forward to the continued support of the member in that regard. Call Cahill Boylan. Thank the Minister for her answer so far. I'm just following on from the transport network. Is it meeting the general demand of the public at present? And they asked it in the context of the rural areas because I know those areas could, uh, could be a reduction in services in those areas. Gormil Moggett. Member, um, for his question. Um, from the onset of COVID, um, I uh, agreed to a reduction. Uh, in services, uh, but right throughout the COVID crisis, we have constantly reviewed passenger demand. We have ensured that we have services on standby to enable social distancing um, across the network. Um, and if the member has any particular concerns uh, about any particular rural service, I'm happy to take that away uh, and look at it. Uh, we have been increasing um, our services right across Northern Ireland in line with our risk assessment and the public health um, advice uh, and the regulations from the executive and the member will also know that TransLink has put on an additional 500 buses to make sure that we can transport our school children safely to and from school. Paul Frew and there's literally seconds left. Speaker, thank you. Can I ask the minister, was it not a monumental error and therefore a matter of regret to the minister not to put in place the apparatus to furlough TransLink staff and has the department calculated how much the furlough scheme could have saved TransLink? In short to the member's question, TransLink did furlough staff. Uh, TransLink also provided a very detailed analysis of the scope and potential for furlough, and which was shared with the finance minister and executive colleagues, which they all um, uh, accepted. Uh, this is an issue that I know causes great hurt to TransLink staff. As one person said to me, every Thursday people stood clapping for frontline workers. TransLink were at the forefront of the fight against COVID, making sure that essential workers were getting to and from work, going over and beyond that. And they find it deeply hurtful that throughout that people were calling for them to be furloughed when it was very clear that the furlough and apparatus did not apply in that instance. 
Okay, members, that ends the period for listed questions. We move on to topical, and I call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm grateful if the Minister could, could outline her likely priorities when she engages with the Prime Minister's new connectivity review to be led by Sir Peter Hendy. I thank the member um, for his question. I look forward to engagement with Boris Johnson on the connectivity review because there has been no consultation, uh, certainly from, with me as the infrastructure minister in our devolved uh, region. Um, I'm very clear about the connectivity review. Connectivity is hugely important. But the British government has signed up to a number of commitments within New Decade New Approach that it has yet to honour. At a recent meeting with Minister Walker, I offered to send again that list of commitments to ensure that the British government honours those. There are key strategic infrastructure projects right across Northern Ireland that would really transform lives. That's where I think we should put in our investment, not into a vanity bridge worth £20 billion between Northern Ireland and Scotland that none of us want. Meg Nesbitt, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for her answer. I wonder if she could tell us that, according to her own road engineers, the top three pinch points in the Northern Ireland Road network and what her intentions are for easing those pressures. Within the programme for government, a new decade, a uh, new approach, there are a number of strategic infrastructure projects that we've all signed up to uh, the A5, the A6, the A1, and we also have had significant and systematic underinvestment in our water and wastewater infrastructure. We now have over 100 locations in Northern Ireland where we're either at or just beyond development capacity. If we believe in building new homes for families, if we believe in growing our economy, then we absolutely must invest in our water and wastewater infrastructure. It's an absolute imperative. I call Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, I understand that there is uh, at least a seven-week waiting list for a practical driving test before the online booking system went live yesterday, and that this morning over 730 people were queuing for over 20 minutes to even get onto the website to book a test. Uh, when will the driver vehicle agency be dealing uh, with the backlog and driving tests and providing a service that meets the needs of the community? I thank the member for his question, and he raises a very important issue. There has been a high demand for driving test booking since the service reopened to all customers after being shut down for several months due to the executive's regulations to prevent the spread of COVID-19. There has been thousands of driving tests booked for October to December, and this includes bookings for the priority groups, those who had tests cancelled, and obviously uh, the new tests. The queuing software has worked well and has prevented the system from crashing, uh, which is an experience that we saw in England. Uh, slots have been released across all test centres up to the end of December, and today the DVA has released further slots from January. The DVA will also be incrementally releasing some additional slots for November and December when staffing availability is confirmed, as DVA continues to recruit more examiners to increase testing capacity as quickly as possible. Alan Chambers. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Uh, you will be aware that there is a large number of experienced uh, driving instructors, both in the private and the public sector. Uh, many of whom can train and test even to a more advanced uh, driving level. I'm sure you fully appreciate the disruption that delays uh, are causing to individuals and the economy. And will you consider bringing in urgent temporary measures uh, to enable additional testing to occur at once? Yes, I want to assure the member that DVA has been taking steps in this regard. We have already recruited three additional examiners. We are in the process of recruiting 12 temporary vehicle examiners and an additional 12 permanent vehicle examiners. The purpose of this is to free up our dual role examiners so that people are freed up to carry out additional driving tests. I understand the disruption that this is causing to people, but I also have to be honest with people. This is a high demand service that was shut for five to six months. We have put in a number of measures around the call uh, system. Uh, we put in the queuing system. Uh, we are comparing, at this moment in time anyway, and it is a fast-changing situation, favourably to other parts of these islands. In the Republic of Ireland, for example, there is an eight-month waiting list for a practical driving test. So these are very difficult times, but I can assure you that the DVA is doing what it can to quickly as possible and safely resume its services. 
I call Joanne Bundy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has said previously, with regard to the same topic, that lessons would be learned from what went on in GB. What lessons does she consider have been learned in what has gone on in the past number of days? Well, as I said, in uh, England, the system crashed when it went online because of the volume of calls. Uh, anticipating that and trying to learn from that, my officials have been very closely engaged with the DVLA in England. That's why we procured a queuing system to ensure that the system uh, would be able to cope. I'm pleased to say that that is happening. And um, We've also, as I said, um, been in a very significant recruitment uh, process as well to bring on additional examiners. We're also exploring how we can provide tests in the evening and on Sunday, but I have to caveat that with the need to ensure that that the road safety conditions are paramount because this is about teaching people to be able to drive uh, safely across all of our roads. Call Joanne Bundy. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, but the truth of it is that a few additional slots aren't really going to sort out the problem. There's a backlog of around 23,000 cases. People do wait for hours to get to the front of the queue, only to be told that all the slots are gone. So, through you, Mr. Speaker, I would ask the Minister if she can tell us why the system went online prior to the published date for it to go online, and why some people were able to get test dates through their instructors in advance of the system opening, because it all sounds a bit animal farm. Well, I, I don't accept the figure of 23,000, uh, and I've heard this cited a number of times. I'd be keen to see the evidential basis for it. As I said, it's a high demand service. When you close a service for five to six months, there will be difficulties. Trying to get a restaurant booked is difficult. Trying to get uh, an appointment at a dentist or a GP is difficult. In respect of the uh, online booking, uh, the official reopening of online booking services for driving tests was scheduled for 8 a.m. on the 5th of October. This was the time the link to the driving test booking service was activated on the NI Direct Front page. However, Capita completed their testing of the system around 8 p.m. and removed the restrictions on the system that have been put in place for key workers and those who had their tests cancelled due to lockdown. We now know that a number of customers managed to access the system from this point, although inadvertently this eased some of the pressure on the service the following morning. I call Trevor Lunn. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, the, the owners of cars more than four years old had their uh, MOT validity certificates extended for 12 months, but it does appear, and I'm prepared to be corrected, that there weren't actually any written communication with them to confirm that. Um, well, what action has the Minister taken in particular to remind those, that group of motorists of their obligation, particularly under insurance policies, to maintain their vehicles in a roadworthy condition? And for his question. Yes, at the beginning of the process, um, TECs were posted hard copy, uh, but given the volume and the need to try to have a smooth and efficient process, we did move to an automated system. Um, and I do know that that has proven difficult for some people. I, I actually think it was Paula Bradley from the DUP who raised that it was a particular issue for uh, older citizens. And so we've been engaging with AGNI and other sector groups to help with the communication around the automated system on that. There is a website, uh, it's a DVLA website called Check Your MOT Status, and anyone can go on that and see what the status of their vehicle is in terms of their MOT and TEC, and I would encourage members to encourage their constituents to do so. But the member makes a very, very important point. The responsibility for the safety of your vehicle rests with the owner at all times, and I would ask members to help me in trying to continually convey that message to the public. Call Trevor Lund. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I suppose the solution to all this would be to bring the backlog of MOT tests up to date. Uh, would, has the Minister considered um, maybe extending the opening hours of MOT centres, perhaps to include some of the opening, or has she even considered licensing private garages to, to conduct MOT type tests as they do across the water? I thank the member um, for his question. In relation to the use of private garages, that's not possible under our legislation. I can confirm that all of the test centres, um, including Belfast, are now, uh, well, Belfast is about to be operational, but the other 14 test centres are up and running. Uh, Belfast was handed back as a COVID testing centre. The lifts are being installed as we speak, and I hope within the next week that that will be live, and that will help with the additional uh, capacity that the member is seeking for his constituents. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Can I welcome the Minister's decision to invest £2.8 million in greenways? I recognise in the Cumber Greenway that there are problems from the boundary of Castlereagh Council 
to, uh, in, into the North Down Council. Can I ask you, Minister, what plans she has to invest in and upgrade the stretch from Hollywood Arches to the Billy Neal playing fields? I thank the member for his question and he is a champion for the Cumber Greenway and his constituency and I welcome his support for the development of greenways uh, more generally. Uh, I remember back to the adjournment debate that you had secured in March uh, and it was uh, in light of that and wider considerations of the benefits of greenways that I found myself in the position where I'm trying to support them. Uh, we wrote to all of the councils to ask them for proposals to invest the capital monies that we have this financial year. I'm very much in the hands uh, of councils. I know that the member has a particular interest around lighting uh, of the Cumber Greenway. I have asked my officials to look into that. That will necessitate um, bat lighting brought friendly lighting, it will necessitate neighbourhood consultation. Uh, but I think the key here is working in partnership uh, with the councils who have much wider remit than I in this. But I want to assure them that I'm keen to do what I can to support the Cumber Greenway and the advancements of greenways right across the north. Well, Robin Newton. I thank you, Minister, for that, and that is indeed uh, encouraging. I would remind the Minister that uh, both Belfast City Council and uh, Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council unanimously voted uh, in favour of the development of, of the, 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 the Cumber Greenway and that stretch. Could I ask the Minister to give us an indication of when she might invest in that stretch? Well, I've made an allocation um, this year. Uh, I hope to be in a position to provide further support um, to other greenways in the next financial year. We've actually asked councils who weren't in a position for us to be able to invest capital as money this year to be providing us with their proposals so that we can advance and progress through to delivery next year. Of course, that will be subject to funding, but I would hope to be able to advance this agenda while I'm the Minister for Infrastructure. I call Emma Rogan. A lot of people depend on driving for essential journeys, including getting to work. They deserve to have a proper access to important services such as driving tests. Why were our services not better prepared for recommencing? Um, driving tests have recommenced. They actually commenced for priority groups um, uh, several weeks uh, ago. The, the system went live this week uh, for new, new driving tests um, because we had worked through key priority workers and also those who had had their tests cancelled, which I think was the right uh, and fair approach. Uh, as I said in response to a number of questions from ministers, this is a high demand service which was shut for five to six months. But as I hope I have demonstrated in terms of procuring the queuing system for the online service, by demonstrating that we are recruiting um, 27 vehicle examiners, that we are exploring uh, additional capacity in terms of evening uh, and weekend testing, that we recognise this is a really important issue and we are doing what we can to minimise disruption by making sure that we adhere to all of the risk assessments that we have carried out, that we adhere to the public health advice and we of course adhere to the executive's own regulations. Emma Rogan. Gourmet, I have no further questions. It has been answered. Jonathan Buckland. Mr. Speaker, in May 1994, the Euro Tunnel was officially opened, uh, connecting mainland France with mainland United Kingdom, a feat in engineering and a game changer for trade and connectivity. This week, the Minister sadly branded a study plan for a potential Boris Bridge as a, pu a publicity stunt. Can I ask the Minister, will she approach this with an open mind and realise the true potential that such a bridge could bring to the economy of Northern Ireland? Thank the member um, for his question. If there was an endless pot of money, if we had strategic investment in our strategic infrastructure uh, network, I would be happy to look at this. The reality is that this bridge is estimated to cost £20 billion. There are huge questions over its engineering uh, possibilities, but we have to look at the person who is proposing it. He has a long list of vanity bridges that he's never been able to get off the line. So yes, I'm open to all key strategic projects, but I would remind the British government and the Prime Minister that he has gave commitments around new decade and new approach, and he absolutely must honour them. Final seconds, Mr. Buckley. There were sceptics in 1994 for the Eurobridge. I have no doubt they're here today and they're in this chamber, but there is people that want to see their um, the feasibility study to such a bridge and the recognition of the potential that it could bring to the economy. And I would ask the Minister to proactively engage with the community and the transport sector as to how this potentially could go forward. 
and I recognise that this is a project that has support uh, among a number of people, and I do not want to be disrespectful of that. But imagine what we could do with £20 billion. The member is very proactive in representing his constituents to seek uh, advancements and progress to infrastructure in his own constituency, which I support and I would like to do more on. We look and see what we could do in terms of our road network. We've spoken about the need to decarbonise our public transport. Those are priorities. I would not like to be in a position where we were squandering, and I do say squandering, £20 billion on a bridge that neither the Scottish Minister nor I as the Infrastructure Minister see as our number one priority. Time is up, members. Time is up. And, uh, members, please take your ease for a moment or two to be prepared the Chamber.